say thank you to Kathy and Christina for the presentation, and thank you for the university to invite me and for you to come here. Um, I'm going to start right away. Um, Okay, I know there are no questions, but I cannot do it without the questions. I promise Christina not to do this, but if anybody has a question, they can interrupt me. And then we do the other thing after. Um, so basically, I, um, I think that the artist is a researcher and that the art practice is uh, not just a job but it is a social responsibility. Um, I, I read uh, a few years ago a book by Hannah Arendt um, called The Promise of Politics. And in one of the chapters, uh, she was talking about the role of the philosopher in society, comparing um, Socrates and Aristotle. Um, and then it made me think, I mean, it was amazing revelation because I was discovering that the same thing happened in a way in the art world. Like there are artists who decide not to be involved in politics and artists who decide that their role is to precisely help with what they know and the practice they, they have um, understood to create some progress and some change. So. I recommend that uh, book, actually. Um, so basically, um, I position myself as a researcher who come from a place in which um, change happened through art at some point. Um, I want to make sure that when we talk about change, um, it's not a mystical idea of change. Change is a very difficult process is a process that is a transition, a constant transition, and it's a process that also um, is generated through a lot of contradictions. So many times when I've been asked like, do you think your work has changed anything, or how you contribute to change, or how can you measure change on your work, I, it's a very hard question because what do they mean by change, and, and what is their position um, regarding that? I mean, usually people think that change is something that is extremely visible and tangible, and actually when change is happening, it's, very, it's almost invisible. Like it's something very subtle and very, um, you know, something that you feel. You don't have to see it especially. And, and it's a moment in which you, you understand that something is happening and you're part of it. So, but you might not understand it until later. So basically, I want to start um, talking about one of the pieces I did when I was younger. Um, in 93, um, I did a piece uh, called Memory of the Postwar. And it was basically an exercise in which I was uh, taking a form that is used and a resource that is used by power um, as an artist. This has been a very important uh, aspect of my work. At some point, as an artist, I was in a more representational um, situation in which I was trying to, through metaphor and through allegories and all these elements that we have in art, to call the attention to certain issues that, was, that were happening um, in Cuba, where I was living. And of course, I was uh, trying to use the personal as the legitimate a way in which I could talk about these issues. Um, in one way, I really, um, there was a point in which I realized that symbolism was not enough for me because people could get away from, from it very quickly and it didn't, I mean, you need this translation for them to understand. So I wasn't, I mean, it was not what I wanted. It was not the impact. And for me, always the work was about leaving a memory in people's mind. Like that's my work. My work is not to produce an object. It's not to create a space, uh, specifically like for the space per se, but it is to create an experience in the, in the person that is around that will be remembered uh, in the memory a few years later. 
So there was a moment in which I decided that if I was talking about power, I needed to take the elements of power to do my work and, and not just represent it because in part, um, I think part of the reasons why politicians don't take seriously artists is because they understand that the way they, they are doing is uh, a present, representation that can be actually interpreted in so, so many ways, sometimes, unless it's propaganda, that they really can get away from many things. So I decided the, the way to do it was take those resources so people in power understood I was talking to them. And that created a relationship with the audience that, is, that I will talk later. I mean, in my work, it's very clear when I'm working with people and who is the audience. Sometimes it's not the same thing. So here, basically, what I did in 93, um, a lot of Cubans were leaving the island because uh, there was a lot of censorship in the arts. And basically, what I did was to create a newspaper, which was illegal at the time in Cuba. Um, in which I invited all these artists who had left, plus the people who stayed, to think about the situation in Cuba through art, the situation in the arts. And actually, one of the things that happened is like I created that list that you see in the middle, and that's the list of all the artists who were outside of Cuba at the moment of the newspaper, which was actually huge, because Cuba is so small and we have such a little group of artists. So that was a way to, to signal. Of course, what happened when you talk to power is power talk back you, to you. So I was called and, and I was actually censored for this work. Then I went back um, after a few years of negotiating with myself how will I continue working. I, re I realized that I wanted to, to do um, work still about Cuba, but um, from, the, from the point of view of the foreigners. Uh, as you might know, um, Cuba is um, a place that is fantasized about by the left uh, since the beginning of it, for 50 years now. And as much as we, are, we were a project that was very interesting, that project has changed and has become something else. Um, so basically, what I did in this piece is um, a series of work called Untitled, and then in parentheses, the name of the, of the city in which it was done. And it was a project about the elements that you have about a place to judge the place, which mostly are not the real elements, they are just... Um, you know, things that you know through the news, etc. So in this case, actually this image is incorrect because the actual piece was totally black and you enter and it was this very weird smell. People didn't know what it was. And then you enter, it was totally dark and you see a little, you see a little um, image of, a, of a, like a little image there or some light and then you approach and then you see Fidel opening his chest, showing that he has no uh, bulletproof vest. Um, when you were turning down, let's see, the, can you see it? Yeah. So basically, when you think, OK, I already saw the piece, I turn back. With the light that was coming from outside, you could see that there were four people um, actually surveilling the video that were totally naked. For me, this piece was also very important because it was a way to erase the image. So it is creating an image by erasing the image and creating a situation in which the senses are more important than a uh, way of knowledge and, and a way, and I was the first time I started to, to work with the audience as part of the piece. So it was um, uh, not participation art, but it was a piece where the experience was part of the piece itself. Um, so basically, the fact that some people were afraid and didn't want to go in was perfect. Because in that moment, I realized that artists cannot be condescended with the audience, and the artists cannot be, um, I don't want to see nice, but they don't want to, they cannot be, um, 
you know, taking so much care of the audience that they don't do their work. So I decided that if people didn't want to see the work that was actually part of the work, which is great, the same thing happened to, in Cuba. People go and they don't want to see reality, so that's fine. Um, and then I was invited to, to do that series in um, Germany. And I did the opposite, actually. I created um, a piece that was too much light. So it is uh, this idea of how you use light as a way of, of talk about knowledge. And in this case, it was, of course, about the Second World War and in Germany and uh, next to a place where there was this big factory of um, guns during the Second World War. So it was this oversaturated situation where we're supposed to know so much about it that actually we don't know anything. So basically, again, the reaction of the people was not seeing the piece and only hearing the piece in this case because there were people walking on, as you can see here, there were people walking on top with a gun and they were cocking the gun and walking uh, all the time, like there was a, a kind of um, um, prison set up. So this is a shot took from behind, so you could see all the elements of the piece. Um, basically, um, in this case, um, one thing that was important for me is how can you translate something that comes from a um, national background, like the piece I did originally was especially for Cuba, and I was asked by the curator to create a piece that is kind of similar but different. So I think one element that many people, um, especially if you are from countries that are not the center, the so-called centers, or people who think they are the center, actually, um, um, the problem is how can you translate for that audience that is not part of your reality? And this is something that I have been dealing with uh, my whole life in my work. How can you bring the elements that are comprehensive for everybody while at the same time letting the audience understand that they are not getting the whole full picture of what you want to say? And I think that's very important, that they understand that they're missing information when they go and see the work. Um, Another piece I did was in the same series uh, was untitled Bogota, uh, 2009. And um, in this case, like the other cases, for example, in the case of Cuba, I took what is the most relevant element, uh, symbolic element that people recognize the country for, Fidel Castro. Second one, Germany, the Nazi, and the Second World War. So in this case, I took, um, in Colombia, of course, it's a drug. And, um, and then what I did is I created a situation in which um, it was a, a um, you know, like a conversation with four elements. One, a paramilitar inactive. Uh, secondly, um, one leader of Los Desplazados, which is a program created by the government to bring people out of the uh, zone of conflict to the city, but then they are abandoned and there's no further plan to take care of them. Um, one person that had a, a missing family, um, kidnapped probably, and the other person is somebody from La Farc who was actually, um, um, take, you know, she was forbidden to go back to the army because she was, um, they were suspicious about her. Um, so basically I did that, so I created this situation where they ask, uh, I, they were asked uh, what is a hero and what is their uh, sh uh, conditions today in, in Colombia for a hero to exist. And then at the same time, um, a woman, as you can see, was passing with a tray full of cocaine uh, for the audience. So and in this case, for me, um, that was an important piece in the sense that it was let's say one of the first pieces where I realized that the work doesn't exist or start existing after the work's supposed to end. In what sense? I mean, I put the conditions to do this. I create the condition for people to react about something. And the work for me only started after that scene that you've seen stopped. Why? Because what happened is like a lot of people in the audience start reacting and they took the microphone and they start like 
reflecting about what was just happening in the room and why people didn't react to it and analyzing their own situation in relation with foreigners, in relation with their own situation, in relation with the Americans, et cetera, et cetera. I have to say also that this was um, an event co-sponsored by an American university. So I think for me it was very important also to bring that element uh, in the piece. And the last piece I did on the series, on title series, oh, can you please, oh, um, was in Moscow. So in this case, of course, Moscow KGB is kind of the evident. Um, so in this case, what I did is I took, uh, we put um, um, an announcement on the newspaper to see if there was any KGB agent um, still inactive. Uh, still uh, from the active from the time of, uh, of the Soviets, who had work, you know, uh, surveilling the population um, and torturing, uh, having psychological torture to the population. So basically, the operation was very easy. I created a situation where the, um, in, in the newspaper, after we had an announcement of this person with these amazing skills, to repair psychological damage. So it was basically a situation where that person that was trained to be um, a KGB agent and to take information out of you will use that same technique to repair the damage the society has done to you and the, and the Soviet government has done to you. Um, what happened with this piece is very interesting because um, it created an ethical problem. If you have a situation that is an intimate situation, first of all, the KGB agents do not want to be revealed, even 30 years later, because they know they could be in a difficult situation. But also, if you have this intimate uh, place where you have people being psychologically manipulated, the ethical question was, what should I show the rest of the audience? what is the access the rest of the audience should have to this information and to that experience? Because that was done during a biennium, so what rights the people who are coming from outside have to see this process? And, you know, basically it's a, it's, it was an ethical issue that was in front of. The piece was called Trust Workshop. So basically, it's also a commentary about art as a trusting situation, art as a process in which you have to believe as well. So basically, for the exhibition, what I did is I did not show any of that, and I invited these guys who were uh, working on the Red Square, and they were doing tourist pictures with animals, and basically I invited them to come and do the pictures. The thing is that, as you could see, um, in the previous picture, behind this family portrait, you had the portrait of the person who created the KGB. So basically, um, people were so excited about having these animals and having access to this experience that they forgot or they didn't see until they get the photo given that they had this portrait. And only two people decided not to take the photos. Um, and for me, it was very important uh, also in this piece how to use um, a spectacle in the work. Not to be an, a spectacular work, but how to create a spectacle as a device in the work to, to conduct the audience to where I wanted and the moment when I wanted them to figure out what was happening. The way to see the piece, unless you were participating, was through a um, little hole in the, in, the, in the door. Which also, you didn't see what was happening. You saw only like people passing by. Another piece that I um, created in relation with that, uh, in terms of um, people's uh, training, uh, was uh, Tatling Whisper, which is also a series. For me, when I work with people in my work, when I have actors in the work, they have to be the real thing. Like, I, have to, I cannot work with somebody pretending to be something. I really like working with people who have been trained um, 
for certain jobs, so they naturally will become um, what they ask to do, which is their normal job. So in this case, um, what I did was um, we called um, the mounted police, and basically they were asked to do with the audience exercises for crowd control. The thing was that it was a group show, and I never announced, like my presentation was never announced, and I mean, they had the name of all the artists except my name, and nowhere you could find this piece. So it was um, also the idea of, um, of the surprise, but more than surprise, it was the first time where I started using something that I call now political timing specific which is artworks that I created that are related to the specific political moment. Um, in what sense? When that political moment is different, the work will not make any sense. So it is a kind of work in which not only you are kind of linked to the space, to the history of the location, to the cultural, um, uh, to the culture of the place, but also linked to what is the specific political moment in which you are doing the piece and how that is dialoguing with that moment. Why I'm doing this? Because I feel that all my work is ephemeral. Even if I have done object, even if I do uh, uh, performances that can be redone, etc. Why? Because when I was doing the newspaper, when I was doing the work with Ana Mendieta, I realized that politics changes and what happened with your work. You know, like when I started doing Ana Mendieta's work, it was a kind of counter, you know, revolutionary or whatever act because I was going against the official policy for people who had emigrated from Cuba. But then five, six years later, they were welcoming those immigrants to come back to Cuba and invest money in there. So then it became like the fashion to do art for, to welcome those immigrants. So I realized that any political work that is done precisely and rightly so is ephemeral. That doesn't mean they cannot be reactivated. That doesn't mean that that work cannot wake up again and have again like some sort of um, impact or re rereading of what they want to do or what it was meant to do uh, in new circumstances. But basically, it's, it's just a moment of, of a comment. So in this case, for example, um, something that for me was very important is also the contract for the piece to be redone. As you might know by now, um, a lot of performance artists, we um, redo the work. Uh, and that's a way to archive the work sometimes. That's a way to pass it. Um, into the institution, like giving them the permit and the authorization and the instructions of the conditions under which they can be redone. In this case, some of the conditions were precisely that the country in which it was done had to be recently gone through some sort of terror alert or some sort of like tension, uh, political tension and popular tension. Um, of course, uh, there was a reaction of the people who they thought when they arrived that that was like something had happened and you could hear people in the commenting like, yeah, I heard something about a bomb threat the other day. And, like, and that's what I wanted to do is activate it, um, what people had already consumed uh, through the media and already um, acquired as a behavior. Uh, towards certain uh, political uh, elements and see how they reacted to it. And, and in this case, they were extremely passive and they were basically lambs. And only one person in the, all the time we did it um, rejected um, the police. So basically, in a way, it was uh, one of the uh, more clear pieces in which I use two of those concepts, like political timing specific, but also behavior art, which is something I've been working with, which is con arte de conducta, which in Spanish means conduit, but also behavior. Um, and this is something I do a lot in my work as the one I did in Colombia. But another aspect that was very important is like I start understanding through this piece 
and after Colombia also, the importance for artists also to be political in the realm of the art world. Because many artists are political with issues that are outside of the art world. But I feel like if you're really a political artist, you also have to question the world in which you are actually living, which is, in our case, the art world. Um, who needs a lot of changes? Um, and in this case, for example, in that um, contract that I made for, for the uh, selling of the piece to the museum, it was very clear that anybody who wants to take um, documentation of the piece in any medium they wanted could do so, and the institution could not stop them. And also, they could sell commercially that documentation without the intervention of the institution. For me, that was very important because a lot of artists are very political until the money comes in. The money comes in and then, yeah, I give you $10 and then I get 3000 So I think that was something I needed to address, a, a kind of a symbolic way in which you um, make a little equal the relation between an audience that is actually the one doing your work, because without the audience, this piece could not exist, and the, and the institution, in this case, or the artist, who is the one generating the idea. So that, for me, was very important. In the same series, um, Untitled, um, uh, sorry, uh, Tattling Whisper. Um, I did one in which, um, in 2009 too, um, and these are the reference the images. Um, it was based on, uh, Tattling Whisper is all based on um, images from the press. So it's all related to how we acquire political knowledge through the media and how the media um, conditions us for uh, behaving, and how can we activate those images in the real to try to, to create a different training. So in this case, I did uh, reproduce um, a scenario that is the normal one that you see all the time in Cuba, which is, um, you know, Fidel is going to talk, basically. But the difference was that it was in 2009, three years after he had um, left power officially, officially 2008, but de, de facto in 2006. And you could see the idea of the missing of the leader because the piece was done in a way that when it was, um, when it was not active, it was just like this kind of monument, but then People who were in the audience were giving, I don't know if you can see it, they were giving these um, disposable cameras with flash. And the reason in which I did that, it was 200 cameras, was that I wanted the audience to be not only uh, passive receiving this, but also understanding that their, the documentation of the piece could be an element to, let's say, protect the people who participate in the piece. Because by you having a photo taken of somebody who talk, and 200 people taking photos, it will make more difficult for you know, the secret police or somebody to, to take, you know, um, have something done to you later uh, related to that. So basically there were uh, many people talking and we had, um, we had uh, the elements is to have two people dressed as guard. They look like real, you know, uh, army people, and they came together, and uh, with uh, they came together with a person um, to protect them while they were talking. But also, they took the people away after one minute because people had only one minute. Um, the gesture was very simple. It was to open a situation that doesn't exist in Cuba, which is in public spaces with cameras, TV, and everything, have a space where everybody can say whatever they want. Um, it was a very intense situation because um, people were saying things that had never been said in public before, which was extremely intense in terms of politics. Uh, but well, I think the best, I was going to put the video, but I think it's too, it's going to be too, too much. Um, basically, one of the comments I liked the most was 
one person who come to the stage and say, I hope one day in Cuba, freedom of speech doesn't have to be a performance. So that for me was the most uh, like synthetic way of, of talking about this piece. Of course, there were people who talk against the government, there were people who talk in favor, uh, which is part of democracy, of course. Um, but again, um, I have feel uh, over the course of the, the work I have done, um, I, I felt that when you are um, really touching um, and really doing political work is when you do something that has a consequence. You know, doing political art that really, you know, you have to worry about what is going to happen with you or with the people who are next to you or with the situation you're generating. So I feel like artists have to take responsibility when they are doing political art. When they're really, really doing political art, it's something that has consequences. So if you have consequences, you have to, to deal with that. And sometimes, to be honest, when I prepare my work, I think more about what is going to happen and what are the ways in which I can control what is going to happen the way I want to control it than the actual elements I put in the work, which is a lot of work, to be honest. Um, so basically, that piece is called Self-Sabotage, and it was a piece I did um, for the Venice Biennial. And, um, and of course, the Venice Biennial is the hardest uh, environment to do an artwork that I have known if you want to do something political, because while it's extremely political, in the inside is being shown as the washed out political situation where nobody what you do, being in the biennial in Venice is like overshadow any political statement you want to do. So in this case, I created this piece where it's called self-sabotage, and basically what I do is I read some text um, about responsibility and what is political, and, um, and I decided to illustrate this point every time I, I finish like a chapter or that is actually a page, and illustrate that with um, the idea of bringing things onto the ultimate consequence. And it was also a call for artists who want to do political art, but they really don't take risks. You know, they do it from a safe uh, point of view. So I think I was a little literal in this piece, but basically I, um, what I did is I played the Russian roulette um, every time, so, so yeah. And yes, it was real, because everybody asked all the time, so. Yeah, so basically, um, what it was more sad for me is I knew that if I have died, it will be just a little comment over a party at night in Venice Biennial, you know? That's what is sad about that, those events. So basically, you know, it was kind of a dialogue about, and of course, after I did this piece, everything disappeared, I didn't left any, um, table or photos, I, everything disappeared because I didn't want to, the fetishism. No. And I also like throw the gun into the water, but not in front of people, like it's not part of the thing, but after I left and, you know, because I didn't want that kind of. <clears throat> Basically, um, and I want to show you this uh, relationship with the art world, because I think, again, that is extremely important that we are conscious about those tensions as well. And in this case, I was invited to um, a big museum in Paris, and uh, <clears throat> they had this series where they invite an artist for one week to do whatever they want with the collection. <coughs> so basically, what I did is I went to the new media collection. I'm not a curator, so I didn't know what to do, really. And uh, I went to a new media collection, which is one of the main, most important collection because they started really early on. And what I decided was to um, actually write to all the artists who were in the collection and um, ask them permission to pirate their work, uh, make copies as, as I could, um, and sell the, co the whole collection of the Pompidou in the street for one euro a piece. 
So basically, um, it was a very easy, uh, I will say, exercise because it was taking out of the institution the work that was done basically for massive distribution and going back to the origin of uh, was the idea of video art, which is everybody can have an, an accessibility, and now we all play this game where we are like limited edition of five of something you can make 300, you know? And um, what was interesting is that a lot of people uh, were buying this. I had also one person in the metro, the person who sell the actually counterfeit of, of movies, and um, for me, what was very pathetic, actually, is that some collectors realized that this was happening. And I had two reactions. One, a person who came to me through the curator of the museum, she wanted to know exactly which pieces I did make personally, the pirating, and which one, you know, because that's the one she wanted to buy. And of course, I never told her because that's so stupid. And the other person, uh, decided to buy the whole collection because they realized, it was a couple, they realized that they were buying the piece of two artists for, the, for one dollar. Because it's my work plus the work of the original artist. So I think it was interesting how everything was kind of, um, um, did, you know, activated. In this case, I just wanted to show you um, two images of the inside. So basically, when I talk to the artist, the only way they could be part of the exhibition is if they give the permission. So if they don't want to give that permission, they could not be. And actually, it was um, shown as a storage room where people could see the actual work. I mean, I'd make a copy of uh, what it was outside, inside, and also another couple um, or maybe the same couple, I don't know, these guys came the last day and they stay until we finish and they approach me and say, we want to buy that one. I'm like, what do you talk? Yeah, because that's the one that was inside the museum. I'm like, no, of course not. And then, and I was like, this is against fetishism. How can you, you know? So basically, this was the way it was shown. Like you can see, you could not enter the projection or you could see it in a very, like, it was very, um, like, not giving too much importance to the setup of the projection. And then we showed the letters, the positive and also the negative. The museum wanted to erase the name of the people who were negative, but of course I erased it in a way you could read it. <laughs> come on. Oh, that's the hat, oh, sorry. Oh, come on. <laughs> And then, um, this is a, a piece I did for um, uh, our fair. I don't, I'm, I'm not having very much luck with galleries. It's my problem, it's not their problem, I think. I cannot communicate with them. They always ask me to do like paintings or drawings or videos, and I'm like, no. And then, <laughs> yeah, it's very sad. And, um, and then I got invited to this um, exhibition. I actually left all my galleries except one because my sister was like, if you left all of them, they're going to say you are the problem. So I'm like, okay, so I, I kept one that I haven't shown with her like in four years, but whatever. Um, so basically, um, this piece I did for an art fair, and basically what I wanted to do is to think about what are the limitations of collecting. Um, I, I wanted to, to make an, I mean, I don't produce objects normally, and people who, who are collectors or work in galleries know this. So I produce an object, so my galleries was extremely happy. But then I appeared with this, and she was a little nervous, because, of course, um, it is a piece that is impossible to buy, in the sense of the meaning of the piece, you know? And I did it in a moment that was close um, to the moment in which that was stolen, actually. It was something that impacted me very much. I read the news about they stole the actual um, sign, and they cut it in three, and I was for many days thinking, who will do that? How? I, mean, I was very disturbed by this gesture. And, um, and then I brought it to this place, and. I was extremely naive because somebody bought it. But it has not shown, apparently. Apparently it has in a storage or something. So that's a failure. 
in a way. So OK, let's talk about what we came to talk about. Uh, <laughs> um, so basically, um, my work is divided in two big areas. One is the short-term projects and the long-term projects. Mostly of what you have seen is the short-term projects. What do I mean by short-term projects? Our work that is done for the temporality of the art world, meaning an exhibition or you know, an opening, something that understand that the, the time in which it exists is a time of consum con uh, artistic consumption that is very quick, meaning you can see it, you get it, you continue seeing the show. And it's also like a kind of like very punctual intervention in very specific aspects. Very, very, for me, very clear and very, very specific. Then the long-term projects are more complicated <laughs> because they are projects in which I hope to, to intervene in the social tissue and to intervene in um, actually um, what is called change. Um, it is a longer suffering situation, but I really like doing it. Um, and I believe very much in these long-term pieces. Um, part of what makes these long-term pieces um, the way they are is the fact that you need to understand they are a constantly changing piece. I mean, the way I talked to you about all the previous pieces, they are what they are, and every time they are shown, they are mostly shown the same way, because that's what they are. They become a static comment about something. Um, that's why the context is so important. But in this case, these are projects that are in constant, constant change and constant reevaluation of themselves and constant contradicting of themselves. So the first piece I did for long term was Ana Mendieta's homage, which is, as uh, Cathy was talking, it was an homage to the work of a Cuban artist in which I reproduced all her work. And um, um, I reproduced all the work, and I was um, doing that as a, as a political gesture for 10 years. So I did it since the year she was dead, dying, 85, to 96. Um, and it's interesting because now a lot of people are doing redoing performance and all that. And it was very funny because when I did it, Gallery Le Long approached me and the state of Anamendita approached me because they wanted to basically make sure I don't continue this project because they were afraid that what am I going to do with those objects, you know? And of course I, I say I don't want the objects, I will totally you know, and I destroy every piece I did. Um, but it's interesting that it did touch a political nerve as well, which is the nerve of commerce. Uh, in this case, it is very different. It is uh, about the situation of, it is related with Ana Mendieta because also Ana Mendieta was a trans-territorial project. Uh, in this case, I, um, I was inspired, we can say, by the events in Paris. I was there when they had the big riot in the outside, the suburbs, and, um, and Sarkozy was the head of um, the interior minister. And <clears throat> I was extremely um, thinking about that and thinking about the lack of political direct political representation for immigrants and the way in which a lot of immigrants were uh, pushed to have as their only way to talk violence because that's what that was given to them and that's what they could you know answer with sometime and you know i start talk, thinking about that and i start talking with friends there and <clears throat> i was establishing myself there as well after living in chicago and i realized a lot of the same problems i had were repeating there so i realized that you know I know a lot of people uh, don't agree with this, but I, I do feel that there are elements that no matter what culture you come from, no matter what social class you come from, um, you have to confront as immigrant. And th those elements do not have to be economic, do not have to be cultural. They are human problems. And, um, and I think that's kind of what we want to do in immigrant movement, is try to redefine, in a way, what is the immigrant in the 21st century, because it makes no sense that we're talking about globalization of everything except of people, unless you are part of the elite, of course. 
So basically, this is a piece of Arteuti. Arteuti is another concept. And for me, I want to say this because I know there are students in the room. So um, for me, it was very important to create my own concepts. Um, arte de conducta, arte uti, política también específica, etc. Why? Because I, real, I feel, and I'm very strongly advocate for the constant uh, creation of new ways of talking about our practice. Part of what I see that happens in what is called, you know, public engaged art or participatory art or performance art is like many times the critics, the tools the critics have to to talk about the project are the wrong tools because they're tools that belong to other genres, to other practices. So sometimes already in that, you can see that there is um, an inherent contradiction of the discourse and, and people are looking at the wrong things to, to judge the work by because this element. So I feel that it is good that we created our own um, concept when, you, when we need it, when we feel that what we're doing is not understood in these areas. Um, and well, this is the place. In this case, we have a space, um, which now in the third year, I think is a mistake. But at the time, it was, it feels that it was the right thing to do because I needed to create the context for the work to exist. So I couldn't do a project about immigration without being part of that country without creating the conditions for the work to exist. And of course, I'm very happy that now immigration is part of the national politic discourse, apparently for real, and hopefully it will happen. Uh, so basically, the, the four principles, but back then in 2011, it was not so present, actually. Um, um, these are four, five, five elements that we use in the project. One is a relation between practical knowledge and creative knowledge that we do through an educational side of the project uh, with the community, but also with uh, people who are um, not the direct part of the community. Uh, and for us, it's very important because we want people to have concrete knowledge of how to navigate better the society they are new to. But we also want to put creativity in everything because we want them to, to use the tool of art and the creativity to understand the world in a different way, to understand they can change things and things can be actually different. They don't have to accept what they are going through. So uh, basically we have a lot of, for example, we have one class that is art history for immigrants' mothers, stay-at-home moms, that deals with uh, gender identity politics. So this is, for us, it's, we use art all the time in the project. We don't use art in a historicized way where the most important part is that you have to know the history from the gesture, uh, but it's more about how can you implement art in the everyday life and as a way to enter a uh, way of thinking instead of um, just its own history. Then, uh, of course, we, want to, we would like to change the perception about recent immigrants. I have to be honest, in this case, I'm a little frustrated because we work very hard, but at the end, you know, uh, we are like a one tiny, small piece of sand <laughs> that really, you know, we haven't, you know, we haven't done a lot, but I feel like we didn't change anything, to be honest, because all the people had better position and better voices and better access to to do that in much longer work than us. So, of course, the Phoenician of the 21st century. Um, and in this case, you will see later that one way that we want to define that is we want to change the word immigrant for the word international. Because immigrant has a lot of wrong connotation. It has implications, legal implications, uh, unfortunately, which is not the origin of the word, but they, they are assumed and they're seen popularly as a not very positive thing. Um, unless you're an established immigrant. And what we want to call people is, I am international, instead of meaning the good things that happen with that. Arte Uti, we talk about it, and also the idea of the archive. Um, it was very important, the idea of the archive, because we want to have a situation in which you can access the project. Since it's a long-term project, it's so complicated. We want people to access the project from different level of complexity. So you can have a quick, view of the project, you can look at the website. By the way, we're changing it. 
Um, or you want to know a little more, you can go to the space. You want to go a little more, you can listen to all the recorded meetings. We have all the meetings are recorded. You can access our actual archive and go in deeper and deeper in the process of the project. So I think it's also a situation where the person who wants to know about the project, who wants to become the audience of the project, is interested and have to show interest. I have only one more minute, so let's see how can we do this. Um, we did the Migrant Manifesto. We also invite artists to come um, to in residency. We work for the people in jail, and we also created the, uh, here, the Migrant Respect um, Campaign pin. We also talk at the United Nations um, about uh, reading the manifesto. We work in the Occupy with this. We invited artists to do projects around the world uh, December 18 every year. And one of the reasons for this is like artists are immigrants. Like 95% of the artists are immigrants. But they don't recognize themselves as such. They recognize primarily as artists. And we want to create this relationship. Um, so, okay, this is very quick because I don't know. Um, um, the other thing is like we did um, El Partido Pueblo Migrante, which is the version of the project in Mexico. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that we have been we were selected, I mean, we were one of the 50 parties that made it to the first step to become a real party. I mean, there are like 17 other steps and it's a very corrupted process, but at least we made the first. Um, well, I have no time to talk about all of this, but... Uh, and then now we are doing a campaign, we're starting uh, a campaign with the community on issues that uh, we can, this is a postcard we, we are printing. This is a billboard we're doing in Austria. And this is something interesting. We want to, this is a sticker, so we want to use the, the possibility, the art world, the globalization and the access of the art world gives that you can do something for Austria or, or for Argentina, you know. Um, you know, this is a poster. Um, so basically, we want to use that in benefit of uh, immigration. Uh, this is a t-shirt we, we having. Um, and basically, can I talk two minutes? Okay, good. Okay, super quick. Um, so Arte Uti, this is uh, the latest adventure. <laughs> and basically, um, well, this is it. This is what we're going to do. Community members are going to choose artists in residency for the summer. And um, this is something I want you to read. If you want me, I read it for you, so make sure you read it. So basically, these are the criteria that uh, we came up with for Arte Util. So you don't have to be Arte Util. You don't have to have the, all of them. You have to have three of those. I hope you guess which ones. So number one, you have to have it, which is propose new uses for art within society. Number two, challenge the field with, is, with which it operates, civic leisure. Be timing and specific, responding to current urgencies. Be implemented and function in real situation. That also is very important to have. Replace author with initiator and spectator with users. Six, have practical beneficial outcome for its user. That's the most important one. Pursue sustainability with adapting with uh, changing conditions, reestablishing aesthetic as a system of transformation. So basically, the project I'm doing right now is I'm devoting this year within also immigrant movement because now the machine of immigrant movement is moving almost on its own, uh, focusing on the idea of arte útil and implementing the discussion about um, and this is something I have to say, like I was talking the other day with one of the people who is uh, part of this project and he said, you have to be less soft because I was like, yeah, I accept every art. And he said, no, you have to be more militant. So I'm saying it now. I do not like useless art anymore. And I understand he has his position, but I feel what is happening now with all this like, um, public engaged art is precisely that we are moving to new territories where we are questioning the function of art. We are questioning what, uh, what is the role, as I said at the beginning with the work of Anna Arendt and the philosopher, what is our role in society? What should we do? 
Are we going to still be the crazy people nobody take seriously? Or are we going to be part of the whole group of people who are trying to change society? And for that, you have to have a different kind of art, you know? So basically, we have four hypotheses. One, the eyes ethics. This is something, oh, this is wrongly written, but okay. It's eyes ethics which is actually something, another concept I came up with, which is a way in which you can look at this work. The aesthetic part of Arte Util is precisely the relation with ethics, and the way in which you're changing and trying to transform ethics. You know? And when I talk about ethics, I'm not talking about morals, I'm talking about the development of behavior you know, in a group. So this is, um, these are one of the the second is access and replication. So basically these are four hypothesis areas we're trying to talk in the, in the first part of the project, which is a lab um, that is happening right now at Queen's Museum and you're welcome to come. We're going to have working groups uh, on each of these areas. And these are basically the questions that we're asking ourselves in terms of useful art. And this is the last one. And, um, I do believe that we can change the world. It takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of anonymity, takes a different way in which we approach the practice of art. And to finish, I just want to say that my best work ever, the thing I'm more proud of my whole life, I cannot show, which is that I was invited with 12 other people to the United Nations to write a document or to help uh, write a document about cultural and art rights and artistic freedom of speech. And I was talking to Christina and I was saying, this is incredible, like I cannot even show the work because first of all, it's going to be uh, disclosed in March so I don't have the right to show anything yet. But also um, in the actual UN in New York, but the other thing is like, it's incredible that the most important thing I have done my whole life, what I felt I have done everything for, is something anonymous, collective. Yeah, my name is in the collaborators, but who's going to read the last page, you know? Like, it's anonymous and a collaboration. So I think that says a lot about what we should do in society right now. Thank you so much.